Oh, it's time? Yeah. Hey, folks. Welcome to Kobe Johnson's capstone presentation today. It is uh, a great privilege that I get to introduce him, and it is also something very sad for me because um, Kobe has become a very dear friend. I met him at Freshman Retreat 2019 when I heard someone quoting Shakespeare's Mark Antony uh, in the hall there at the 4 H Center. Right? And I had to find the student who was doing that. You remember that film? And then I got to know him at uh, Tough Talks in uh, uh, freshman year, his freshman year, and that was quite a ride, <laughs> wasn't it, <laughs> uh, We have since worked together and uh, worked together on this uh, capstone project. Uh, he has been a great gift to me, and I'm going to be very, very sad to see him graduate. Please join me in welcoming Kobe as he presents on Healthcare, economics, social policy, and the ethical foundations for the professional nurse. Hi. Thanks, uh, everyone, for coming out. Um, I want to start by saying thank you um, to the Honors College, first and foremost. I am certainly a different person today than I was when I walked to the halls of the 4 H Center. I think anyone would be hard pressed to say that I am not a kinder, gentler, more compassionate person as a result of my time in the Honors College. I think there have been tons of experiences, but I am extraordinarily blessed um, to, to know Doug and Donna and Trisha and Lenita and all of you, all of my peers. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Second, thank you to the School of Nursing. Um, I think it is, it can be easy criticize, to judge, to point fingers. Um, and trust me, we will get to that, I promise. Um, but I think it's harder to recognize and to genuinely, genuinely say thank you when someone has done good in your life. When I graduate in May, I will understand what it means to take care of people. That is not something I could say when I got here in fall 2019. I grew up with a, a nurse in the house, a nurse in the family, a nurse educator. But I, I never understood what it, mean, what, it, what it means to take care of people. And so exercising the idea of patient-centered care, for example, is something that, the, that the, the School of Nursing has given me. And for that, I am eternally grateful. We do, however, have to recognize that there are certain systems and certain processes that can be improved. There are always certain systems and certain processes that can be improved. And so today I want to look toward the School of Nursing, ours and school, schools of nursing across the country. All right, this is not specifically about ours. This is not specifically about Arkansas or UCA. This is about how we teach nurses for the future. In 2021, the National Academy of Medicine produced a report. They called it the Future of Nursing 2020 to 2030, charting a path to achieve health equity. Chapter seven of that report specifically focuses in on the ways in which we will be training nurses in the future to think and to act about issues of health equity, health policy, and leadership. I want to look specifically at an excerpt that started that chapter. I promise my whole presentation will not be blocks of text, but this one I think will guide our discussion. And so for that reason, it will be read. By 2030, the nursing profession will look vastly different and will be caring for a changing America. Nursing school curricula need to be strengthened so that nurses are prepared to help promote health equity, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well being of everyone. Nursing schools will need to ensure that nurses are prepared to understand and identify the social determinants of health, have expanded learning experiences in the community so that they can work with different people with different life experiences and cultural values. They should have the competencies to care for an aging and more diverse population. They should be able to engage in new professional roles and be nimble enough to adapt continually to new technologies. They should be able to lead and collaborate with other professions and sectors. Finally, nursing students and nursing faculty not only need to reflect the diversity of the population, but also need to help break down the barriers of structural racism, 
prevalent in today's nursing education. These are the words of the National Academy of Medicine about where the future of nursing is going. But when I read this, there are certain things that pop out at me, certain things that jump out at me and say, this is important, right? So I see kind of two distinctions, a set of realities, a set of facts, and then a set of skills that are needed to accommodate those facts. When we're looking at nursing profession will be vastly different. Think for a moment about the nurse of the old movie or the old TV show with the white skirt and the gown and the pointy white hat. And then compare that to the pictures that we saw coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. A nurse is gowned out in their PPE, right? Titrating their drips, right? Moving pumps, lines, drains, tubes, right? They're all, this is nursing is vastly different and nurses are being asked to perform increasingly complex tasks. America is changing, what America looks like, who's in the country, what they look like, who they pray to, how they eat, where they live. These things are changing. And as such, the nursing profession must learn to change with it. And I go through the rest rather quickly, right? We see some skills, right? We need to, nurses need to understand and identify so that they can promote, improve, and reduce. We need to lead and collaborate so that we can help break down barriers. We need to be nimble and adapt continually because there will be new professional roles. What I see stands out here is that the nurse of tomorrow needs an understanding of systems-based thinking, process-oriented approaches. And so we have to look at how does nursing education, how does the way that we train nurses for the future allow, allow us to give them that approach, to give them that understanding. My central claim is this. Moving forward, it is imperative that baccalaureate schools of nursing inculcate into every student an understanding that the capacity to critically analyze the status quo, then critique, challenge, and revise it when necessary is a mandatory component of the profession. Mandatory component of the profession, the ability to think about the world, what it looks like, and then compare that to what it ought to look like what it can look like. And so this is where we're going. This is our goal. This is our vision for the future, right? This comes from me. This comes from the National Academy of Medicine. This comes from the American Nurses Association. These are the skills that we are pushing nurses towards. But what's our gap? Let's do our gap analysis. What I've done here is I've taken the syllabi from two courses that at least in theory are meant to give nurses these skills. So these are our School of Nursing, and these are the, the two most previous iterations of the syllabi. This, these are Nursing Leadership and Management and Health Policy and Professional Issues. Nursing Leadership is currently being taught right now. This is the syllabus for the class that is currently being taught right now. This is Health Policy and Professional Issues on the right. That class will be taught again in the spring. The last time it was taught was in January. This is the syllabus for that class. When we look at where nurses are asked to put their attention, where student nurses are asked to put their attention, there's a heavy emphasis on exams. And in the School of Nursing, an exam is A, B, C, D, E, right? True or false, drop, select from the drop down. But we understand that nurses in the future, they can't think like that with respect to leadership, with respect to policy. Right? I don't negate, I don't challenge the idea that this approach may be suiting, maybe may fit an approach for nursing care of the older adult, right? nursing care of the, of the pediatric, caring for a mother and her baby, adult nursing one, critical care nursing. So in these aspects, this approach may do just fine because they are fact-based, fact-specific. The problem is leadership and policy are not always fact intensive as they are process and systems intensive. And so I wanna move us to a world where we're moving toward that, toward that direction. And so I decided to take one of these courses, just one, and redesign it in such a way that puts us to where we want to be, that puts us at where we're going. So I chose health policy, why? One, because if you see, the exams for health policy are at 35% of your grade. Whereas the exams for leadership are at 60% of your grade. And so to me, it seems more feasible to bring 35 down to zero than to bring 60 down to zero, right? Second, leadership is weird in the sense that 
there are things taught in that class that are tested on the NCLEX, the post-graduation licensure exam. So I think it would be slightly more difficult to convince nursing faculty to totally strip out exams from leadership than it would be to totally strip out exams for health policy. So we're, we're through our lens today, we are looking at health policy. Health policy, public policy, economics. How can we teach nurses these concepts, these ideas, without using this here, know this fact and regurgitate it? So I see four principal limitations with the traditional approach. First, it creates a negative effect on context analysis. If any one of you were to sit into a nursing school class, you would hear very often, you're reading too much into that. Don't ask what if, right? Or don't think about that. Only think about what's on your screen. Well, all the only information you get in your question is what we give you, right? But we understand that that's not leadership. That's not policy, right? Policy is a contextual analysis. Leadership is a contextual analysis. How do, real how do the realities of the day inform the way that we lead? How do they inform the way that we construct policy? So when I sit for a leadership exam or for a policy exam and I'm told, don't ask what if, I say, this content necessitates that I ask what if. Nurses of tomorrow are gonna to be required to ask what if because people are diverse. Places are diverse. Homes, living environments are diverse. Second, there's an, the, the traditional approach places a reliance on a predetermined set of assumptions. When an instructor writes an exam, she must understand that anytime she's writing a multiple choice exam, there are assumptions built into those answers. When she writes the question, there are assumptions that are built into the question. You can't get rid of them, they're there. And so then when I take to the test, I bring with me certain assumptions about the world, right? And so I may totally understand this content, but as soon as the assumption that you wrote into the test doesn't match the assumption that I brought into the test, we're now at a disconnect. And in that case, the student loses. What we need in policy education, what we need in leadership education is an environment where students can say, I question this assumption. I disagree with your assumption. I disagree with the standards that you set for what it means to be a leader, or what it means to enact good policy, right? what it means to create a good working environment. We have to allow students the freedom. We should be expecting students to take charge and say, I don't know if those things are going to work anymore. And so in a leadership class, in a policy class, we can't limit it to A, B, C, D, E, to true or false, right? Because we have to expand it. We have to give them opportunities to think, right? Third, we're, punitive, we're being punitive towards a growth mindset with this traditional approach. If you are required to stay, to stay within the four corners of your exam, the nursing profession will stay where it is, right? Many will think that, it is the job of master's prepared nurses or doctorally prepared nurses to ask some of these more important questions. But we have to think about how nursing actually compares to other professions, other healthcare professions, right? In order to be an entry level speech pathologist, you have a master's degree. In order to be an entry level physical therapist, you have a doctoral degree. In order to be an entry level social worker, oftentimes you have a master's degree. And so we have limited this idea of what nurses should be expected to do based off of the, the degree that they're getting and not based off of the skills that they need to perform their function, which is to heal. And so when we limit you to the four corners of an exam, the four corners of a test, we say, okay, you have to stay here. But leaders and policymakers don't stay here. They create they grow, they expand their understanding of what it means to provide high quality clinical care. Fourth, the traditional approach reinforces undesired stigmas, right? So there are expectations, assumptions about how nurses should interact with physicians, right? About how nurses should govern themselves in a board meeting. There are these predefined expectations and these stigmas that come from a time that no longer exists. 
It come, we, we come from a time where the physician can speak to the nurse any way he wants and she's expected to just fall in line, right? That's not the case anymore, right? Because now I can lose my license if I fail to catch something that the physician does wrong. I'm independently licensed. It is my responsibility to ensure that my, to ensure that my patient is receiving high quality clinical care. And so if I'm unable, at least in school, to question the underlying stigmas of the profession, to question the underlying stigma of the general healthcare environment, how will I ever get to a point where when I'm on the phone with a physician or I'm looking at an administrator in the face, I can say, I don't believe that that is the safe thing for my patient and therefore I cannot comply. Right? We have to teach nurses these skills. How do we do that? How do we get from, how do we close the gap? How do we get from where we want to be and where we are how do we close that gap? My argument is that we need to move further away from the predefined, further away from the A, B, C, D, E, and closer towards expansive models of thinking, closer towards an environment where nurses are asked, not what is the reality, but what is the reality and what ought the reality be? Or how might the reality change if we did this versus doing that? And so as we develop this new understanding, as we move from testing to writing, we are creating an understanding of nursing that has not existed, but that the National Academy of Medicine, and I both agree, is coming very, very soon. And so in order to close this gap, I think we need to do two specific things. We need to move from testing to writing, specifically in these policy and leadership classes, and we need to move from telling to discussing. If you sit in a lecture day, in the School of Nursing, you will be talked at for six hours. So you will get to class at nine, you will leave at noon, and they will talk at you for three hours. And then you will take a break, and you will come back at 1.30, and they will talk at you from 1.30 to four about what it means to be a leader, about what policy should look like. But when we're talking about what leadership is, where policy should look like or where it's going, we can't do the top-down approach, the I give to you what you ought to believe. We have to talk about how these things, how these ideas relate to one another. And so this is my approach. This is my change. I present five landscapes of healthcare policy in my thesis. When you look at, say, the health policy thesis, the health policy um, what are those things called? Syllabus. syllabus. When you look at the health policy syllabus, um, and you draw out the principles, or you go through a health policy textbook, and you draw out the principles, these are the five categories that I think that health policy lands into. Today, as we sit here, I only want to focus on one, and how we are going to train nurses to act in this new way, to think in this new way, using this new understanding of nursing education. So you should all have a handout. If you didn't, they're sitting right over there. In this hand, this handout starts with an understanding. So that this is my understanding of what we're moving towards. So I have broken each of these landscapes into two days. So the way that the nursing program is set up, next semester we get, they only have class on Tuesdays, right? 14 Tuesdays next semester. Then we typically have guest speakers in health policy which means that there are about 10 days, 10 actual in-class days, where students or the, and the instructor are talking face-to-face -face and having to disseminate content, disseminate information, which perfectly lines up with the fact that I have five landscapes and we'd like to spend about two days on each one of them. How are those days split up? Day one is always theory, right? Here are the theoretical foundations, the theoretical approaches, approaches that we bring to this landscape of healthcare. So if you look at the, uh, the factual information in the objectives for day one, it's a lot of just like, know this fact, right? That doesn't go away because we're learning expanded thinking. There are certain facts you do need to know to be a good practitioner. But those are objectives at the end of the day, right? You should know these facts for NCLEX or in order to do the higher level analysis, you should know these facts. Day two is always, it's applications to healthcare. So when we look at how do we apply this theory, these theoretical frameworks to the landscape of healthcare, what does it look like, 
right? This idea on day on day one, we're talking about all about supply and demand. We want to talk about it. We question the underlying assumptions, but which, on day one, we talk about general supply and demand. That's not a nursing context. It's not a nursing idea, right? But then we can talk about on day two, insulin. And we can ask the question, why is it that milk can be so cheap, but insulin is so incredibly expensive? What are the economic forces at work that create the difference in those realities? So understanding the theory and then applying it toward the healthcare setting, the healthcare environment, is kind of the goal for the two-day approach. So now we look at, okay, well, how do we actually give them the skills that we're talking about here? How do we get them to where we want to be? Well, we're going to make them right. Right? Nursing students in a policy class, in a leadership class, should be expected to write and to think. So they will read so on, on both days, on every day, on all 10 days, there will be required readings, right? I'm sure many of you are used to this in the honors college, right? You come in having already read the material, right? You've already read the facts. You don't come in with, like, oh, I don't know the facts about this. You come in with the facts, it's like, okay, these are the facts. We can then question and challenge the facts, right? That there's there's certainly room for that, but for the most part, it, with theoretical economics, like entry level, we're not generally questioning the underlying facts. So let's talk about its application, right? So you've read, you've come to class, you've already read. Now write before you come to class. Write to me, right? And so every day, both days, is a journal prompt, and those journal prompts. Oftentimes, most of the time, almost certainly, you cannot find the answer in your reading because the answer's not in your reading. The answer comes from your brain, right? The answer comes from you looking at the reading, analyzing the reading and saying, okay, hey, what assumptions come from this, right? What realities about the world are built in to this framework? Do I agree with them? Are they right? Do they apply to healthcare? How do they apply healthcare if they do? And so this approach then, once we come to class, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about the individual facts, right? We can spend a few minutes on it if there's someone who's not on the same page, but once, we get to, once we're on the same page about where, we, where the facts are, where the facts stand, now we have to move on to, okay, let's apply them. Let's say, well, what does that mean in the context of our profession? And so that is how I want to move, right, to creating nurses of the future. If we're going to have high quality, safe nurses, we have to have nurses who have expanded understanding of what it means to think, expanded viewpoints of what it means to interact with the healthcare system. When you look at how the National Academy of Medicine, working with Case Western Reserve, defines and looks at and thinks about what it means to be a high quality safe nurse, I don't get the feeling that regurgitation is at the top of the list, right? When I see, talk about, when I see safety, when you go in and read their analysis of safety, it doesn't sound like Nurses should know these facts, right? Because you can know the fact that you should put a patient with an altered mental status near the nurse's station. That can be a fact that you just know about the world, right? But then we talk about short staffing, right? And we say, well, there's no one at the nurse's station. So I can put them there, but there's no one sitting there, right? How does that fit within this understanding of safety? What about when the budget's tight and the margins are thin? How does that comport with our understanding of safety? How does that comport with our understanding of quality improvement and patient-centered care? These are, to me, seen as if they are open questions about the world, open questions about our profession. But the problem is nurses at the bedside are the ones doing these things, right? Nurses at the bedside are the ones ensuring that the patient is safe, physically safe from harm, emotionally safe from harm, right? We're ensuring that they're receiving patient-centered care. So we can't assume or take it out of the realm of the entry level nurse to understand this kind of high level thinking because when they get to the bedside, this is what they're expected to do. This is what hospitals are expected to do, expecting them to do. So as we move, as we transition to a different world of nursing, as we move towards a world where nurses have expanded opportunities, expanded responsibilities, we have to equip them with the skills so when they go into the world, they can deliver high quality clinical care. I stand up for your questions. <laughs> All right. Questions? Yeah. So I, one of our six students, um, had a 
have you discussed any of this with our nursing professors? Yeah, and so the uh, the idea I'm going to tread lightly here, yes, as you know. Absolutely. So, um, the idea is often that the sense you get is we got to we got to pass it in class, right? So when we on the very first day of school this year come in and they say. 30 of you stand up. That's how many of you didn't pass our NCLEX, and that's not acceptable. It's like, so when I, when I go to them and I say, hey, let's talk about how we can change nursing education, the response that I'm getting is, well, that's not on the NCLEX. That's, that's not tested. It's like, but those are the skills that our nurses need to be good nurses, right? And so the NCLEX, remember, tests minimum competency Minimum competency is, did did you? But did you die though? <laughs> right. That's minimum competency. That's not patient-centered care. That's not excellence in nursing. That is, but did you die though? If you like left the school, of, like, left your job, and your patient has a pressure injury or an infection, but they didn't die. It's like the nurses, the, the NCLEX says, ah, oh, you're good enough, right? I said it's not good enough. That's my analysis to say, that's not good enough. We do need new understandings and new approaches to what it means to be a professional nurse, to what it means to do evidence-based practice. And to me, educating an entire cohort of nurses based on the idea of minimum competency is a flaw. So that's, that's kind of the response that I've got when I talk about this. Hannah. Yeah, fantastic job, by the way. Thank very, you. very great job. And I was, I was thinking a similar question um, that you had as well, because I was just thinking like, how, how is the best way to implement this so we can reach that 2030 deadline? Like, is it like not deadline of uh, that 2030 idea? Like, is it more realistic, or are we going to have to wait for this current generation to be the people that are on the boards, or do you think that there's a possibility where like, you know, we're able to get a little sooner? So, 2030 is the National Academy's deadline. Sure. Um, <clears throat> how? My opinion is this. We want to involve everyone in the process, right? So as much as I would like to say, if you are not of this generation or not of this thinking, step aside, right? We have to involve everyone in the process because the people who are currently making decisions do still have a license, right? They still are meant to be professional nurses. And so, no, I don't want to wait until 2040 or 2050. I would love to see this by 2030. How do we implement it? We, the first thing we do is we leave this idea that our only goal in a school of nursing is to get our students to pass in class. It, it's that, set up that way because it's supposed to be an objective metric, an objective standard, right? Like how do you say in a sociology or history program or biology program that students like got it, like you're a good program. Like how do you measure that the same way is if you're in a professional program and you can say how many of your students got their license, right? But the problem is we've limited that approach. So I think the faster we can get rid of that approach, the faster we can get towards making this a reality. Peyton? So when you were talking about you had the two syllabi for the current programs mm -hmm. and it had the exams as part of the grade um, and you're trying to get rid of that, how are you going to base grades? Are you keeping, like it says, some of these different activities? Are you keeping those? Is it fully about journals? Yeah, it's going to be set structured very much like an honors class. Okay. Right. Very much like you write all semester, right? All semester you're writing and you're being graded. Right, we're analyzing the quality of your writing, the how the ideas are presented, the organization, the structure. We're not saying, well, you have a bad idea, therefore you get a bad grade, right? How is your thinking developing across the semester? And so I think the details, the intricacies of how do you make this so in a nursing class, so there are twelve students, we max we cap our classes at twelve students. But if you have a room of fifty or next next year the school of nursing will admit 125 students. Right, my year they admitted 110, two years before that it was at 100 or 75. So we're expanding our opportunities to create new nurses. So the problem will come in and saying, how do you do these things? How do you implement these things in a way that doesn't seem subjective? Um, I think that that's where we're gonna get into the weeds, right? That's where we really dig into implementing this, go into the vision and developing the course. Um, but I think we start by saying, this is the standard. Right. This is where we're going. This is what we're going to do. 
And so we start with yes, right? Don't, we, we don't start with no and say, well, that seems hard. If we start with yes and say, we're going to do this, let's figure out the logistics. I think that's, a, that's an approach to get us to where we need to be. So yeah, you're gonna be writing, you're gonna be doing a lot of journals. You're gonna be having your cumulative essays, right? Of course, the span of the semester, um, kind of like we would do as a final essay in honors. And so there's a lot of similarities and corollaries there because the skills that you need in both places are very similar. Doug? Kobe, what general economic theory does a nurse need to know and why? I, the idea that, so I think that there are underlying built-in assumptions about the world. And so I think that, for example, scarcity, right? I think scarcity is an idea that the entry-level nurse needs to understand because now when she understands this general economic principle, she also intuitively understands that I can't be everywhere at the same time for all of my patients. There's only so much of me to go around. So in this class leadership, right, and in this class in policy, we talk a lot about prioritization, right? But we don't build the skill of priority, we just say, this is your priority. Right? I'm looking to build the skill of priority. I don't argue, right, that every single fact that they will learn in the course will be directly applicable their very first day, right, at the bedside. That you will need to understand elasticity of demand in order to do your wound changes and titrate your drips. That's not my argument. My argument is the skills that you learn from learning those things will translate to other areas of your practice. And so as we talk about day two, right, day two is all about that straight application, right? And so I think oftentimes though, in order to get to that day two, in order to get to that application, we do have to start with kind of the general, the boring, the mundane economic theory. And so are they doing it to understand the ins and outs of every single thing that they're going to learn? Do they remember it all? Probably not, right? But getting them in the habit of thinking that way. When they do come across a challenge that's not directly within their scope or directly within their line of responsibilities, but they're still expected to find a solution, they've had experience and they've had opportunities to exercise that muscle. Of having to make difficult choices between limited resources. Of, yes, understanding the principle of making difficult choices with limited resources. The idea of right, the assumptions built in. I think, like with that one, we, let's talk about what assumptions are built in to certain aspects of general economic theory, like rationality, right? So we, when we assume that certain people and certain decisions are rational, right? And so these ideas are oftentimes vehicles for getting us to a different, uh, to another understanding of the world. I think these vehicles, one, are fun, right? They're you know, great and awesome, but also we know that we want to move nurses up the chain, right? Where they will be needing to know these general theories, right? And so right now, yes, as the bedside nurse, right? But why is it that all of our CEOs of hospitals got a general business degree, then they went and got either an MHA or an MBA, and now they're like running hospitals, right? It's like, I see that thing, I was like, man, nah, to me it's a little backwards. It's like, we need clinicians at the top, right? But to get clinicians at the top, they also have to understand all this other stuff, right? So all this other stuff comes with that stuff, right? In order to run the hospital, in order to say, we're gonna be delivering high quality clinical care, that is our mission, that's our goal, you also have to understand the business side. And so when nurses learn to understand the business side, to understand the general economic theories, right, general ethical principles, right, general standards of professionalism, when they learn that stuff, they actually increase their ability to have a positive effect on their patient outcomes. Patient? Uh, I, I remember seeing like in 2020, 2021, right? Like these these photos of nurses exhausted after 12 hour shifts, you know, sitting on the ground, like totally shrunk. And I'm sure that was like even more evocative for like you folks who are in the nursing program. Um, and so like just thinking about what you're proposing, like this gives the, it, it seemed like the system failed the nurses and it failed the patients, you know? And giving them these skills gives them the, the ability, the, the, the history of questioning systems and of reforming systems that gives them the power to, to you know, maybe create a system that won't fail them in the same way. You know? Absolutely. So just wanted to go ahead. I think that this systems-based approach really is where we're going to. Yeah. This idea of to understand systems, you need, hint, hint, 
an interdisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. It's almost like that's a thing that we do somewhere on this campus. Mm -hmm. Haven't heard, never heard of it now. Foreign concept. Uh, <laughs> and so um, I think as we, that's why we bring in things like economics and policy. It's because in order to get to those places to make systems-based change, you have to bring interdisciplinary approaches. Trisha? Um, I'm trying to think of kind of how to word this question, but do you think um, you know the, the proposal that you're making here, <clears throat> that the current admission applications and essay or applications and admission process that's in place for nursing now admits a type of student that's ready for the type of thinking that is that you're proposing yeah, in the not at all. classroom. Um, okay. I think that I think that in nursing admissions, right, we're looking at oftentimes again, who are we gonna admit that's gonna pass the inclusion? And so I talked to some instructors within the school of nursing, one of whom has left. And when we look at like, what are we looking at when we're many nursing students? It's like, how far low on the GPA scale can we go before we tip over our NCLEX pass rate to a level we're not sufficient with, right? So that's the standard. So it used to be, okay, we have capacity for 75 students. Now with our brand new beautiful building, we have capacity for now 125 students coming in. How far low on this GPA scale can we go to fill 125 spots and still have a generally acceptable pass rate? And so I think that the admissions process is gonna look different. Um, the admissions process does look different across the, across the country. There are schools who require the students to write essays to get into nursing school, right? There are schools who require other forms of you know, interviews, for example, to get into schools of nursing. We don't do that, right? We, we oftentimes look at wanting the students who started here to stay here. Um, and that's something that has to be thought about, right? There, these are students who came to UCA, majored in nursing, declared, majored in, declared a nursing major, freshman year, and we would like for those students to be able to stay here. Most of them cannot. I think Dr. Gatto, the director of the nursing school says, like one in seven students declare nursing as their major when they enter um, college, their freshman year, right? So, so they all can't stay, but we want as many of them as possible to be able to stay at UCA. And so if we start putting in these structural roadblocks, will we accomplish those goals? So I think from an administrative perspective, that's a lot of what's going on in their heads. And from a faculty perspective, when I, when I, when I talk to them about the admissions process, that's a lot of what I hear. Question? Oh, Dr. Reed, thank you for being here, by the way. You're welcome, you're welcome. Um, so a lot of what you're restructuring is really more about experiential learning compared mm -hmm. to just theory um, and, and regurgitation. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, what do you say to the structure that currently exists that it's difficult and time consuming to grade a lot of writing prompts? Like you all here in this community have smaller courses, you can spend one on one time. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're trying to, because we have so many shortages, we're trying to get as many. And I hate to say we're not trying to say we're scraping the bottom of the barrel to get the worst keep them alive, mm -hmm. nurse. But when you have this demand that you need people and people want to become nurses, how do you then structure a system that allows you to do this, but it doesn't tax the instructor and the staff to try to keep that grading system in a way that it's not, oh, we have 125 journals mm -hmm. to respond to every single day. That's a, a logistic that keep, this is kind of why a lot of courses are structured the way they are, because when you have large enrollments, it's difficult to assess in a mm -hmm. way that doesn't <clears throat> demand a lot of our manpower, all of that. So there are two things um, that I want to address there. This idea, um, of a nursing shortage and trying to push out a demand for nurses. I want to first address that and then address kind of the taxing of faculty. First with the idea of a nursing shortage. I've spoken personally with high level executives in hospitals of now three different hospitals, right? And the consensus that I've gotten is yes, we are we need warm bodies. Like 
we're not gonna pretend as if we need warm bodies, but they need to be quality bodies, right? And so that's the challenge, we, that's one of the challenges what we face is yes, we have to produce more nurses. I totally agree, there is a shortage. We also have to produce quality nurses because if we start diploma milling people and pushing people out because we just need to fill demand, um, then I, I think that nursing will go in a direction that we don't want it, that we don't want to see it. Second, this idea of taxing instructors. I certainly sympathize with this idea, right? You talk to faculty here at UC at the Honors College, you talk to the PAs and the people who are oftentimes the teaching assistants who are grading journals. Grading journals is time intensive, right? So we have to create a system and a structure, what I'm hearing, that allows this high quality level of learning, but also compensates for this level of rigor. I think that one, we have to bring in our faculty, our nursing adjuncts to a greater extent, right? And so we have, we already have an existing structure of nursing adjuncts who are grading papers, who are grading paperwork, right? And so, <laughs> If we are able to bring in this population of individuals that already exists and that we're already using in certain ways and extend their scope, extend their reach into the classroom, I think that's one way we can alleviate the stress put on faculty instructors. Another way is really looking at <coughs> the way that courses are set up in the School of Nursing. So in a course you may have three instructors, right? And they will have assigned days, right? And so currently, right, if I have, for example, in leadership, we have pre-class assignments, right? So we already have something similar to this in leadership. And so it is your responsibility before class to do your pre-class assignment. And then the instructor for that day, it is her responsibility to go in and grade those. There will be a similar structure in, um, in this approach, it will take, yes, a little bit more time. I'm like, I don't concede that, I don't ignore that rather. I do concede that, I don't ignore that. Um, I think it's looking at where are the places we can go? Where can we pull resources that we already have and are already using? Um, I think that peer grading, right, is a place where we can get a lot of that, right? So if it's not, okay, we're switching our, giving our papers to each other and we're asking each other questions about, okay, when I read your thing, I like, totally didn't understand what you were saying, right? And so I think it's bringing in models that are already there in the world and not necessarily having to spend more money, but using the systems and structures that we already have in place to allow for that greater flexibility. Thank you, Toby.